The 2023 NBA season is heating up and I couldn't be more excited. NBA DFS has long been one of my most profitable sports and I think it's a sport that a lot of people get wrong or just overcomplicate. My name is Jordan Chan, I'm the head coach here at Sabersim and in this video I'm going to be walking through the exact process I'm using this year to build winning NBA DFS lineups with Sabersim. So let's go ahead and just jump right in. Now, first things first, to set the stage a little bit about NBA DFS, if you haven't played NBA before or if you're used to other sports, the name of the game in NBA DFS is speed and efficiency. And what I really mean by speed and efficiency is being able to build and then rebuild to late swap your lineups throughout the slate. The main reason why is, there's a couple reasons why. The first is that news is going to break frequently throughout the slate. We only get starting lineups for teams, probably uh, they're supposed to be about 30 minutes before games lock. In reality, they can be anywhere from five to 15 minutes before games lock. And that news that is breaking as starting lineups is coming out is very impactful to the slate. In a sport like baseball, if a hitter ends up not being in the lineup and a different hitter is in there instead, unless it's like a really big name guy like Acuna or, or Aaron Judge or something like that, it doesn't dramatically shift up the slate. And even then, it, it doesn't totally change the slate strategy as a whole. In NBA, starting lineups are huge. A player being on the court gives that player a lot of opportunity to rack up points at a very low salary. So if a starting point guard gets ruled out for one team and then a new point guard is getting ruled in, and that guy's suddenly going to play 30 minutes. Well, there's just a lot of opportunities for points there, and you get a lot of salary inefficiency. This happens pretty much every slate for most of the games on the slate. In any given slate, you're going to be getting starting lineups coming out 30 minutes before the game's lock. It's going to change the dynamics of the slate significantly, and you're going to want to be able to late swap and react to that news efficiently. So ultimately, my process is designed to be very lean and efficient. You don't want to have to take a ton of time to build your lineups or to get a good foundation of lineups because you're going to potentially need to rebuild it quickly throughout the night or even five to 10 to 15 minutes before the slate locks if there's big news that is breaking, and there often will be. Now I'll show you what this process actually looks like in just a second, but the other very important thing in NBA DFS, just like in any other DFS sport, is contest selection and bankroll management. If you haven't seen it already, I highly recommend watching our guide to the DFS Profit Plan, which is a contest selection system that we developed by selecting different contests and then simulating a bankroll as if a player was playing a bunch of different contest types. What happens to a player's bankroll if they only play single entry? What if they only play multi-entry? What if they uh, play uh, all these different types of contests. And the DFS profit plan was the one that we found after simulating a bankroll out was the most profitable while minimizing the risk to losing your bankroll completely. Now, again, not going to go totally into the details of the DFS profit plan in this video, but for this NBA season, there's four things you should focus on. The first is to set a bankroll and play two and a half to five percent of that bankroll per slate. Second, stick to GPPs. NBA cash games are almost a solved game. You might be able to still get a little bit of an edge there by really being diligent with your late swap, but the GPPs are where a lot of the softer money is. It's where softer competition is. It's where you want to be spending your money. Then finally, you're going to fill those GPPs from lowest entry fee to highest. That's going to do two things. First, it's going to put you up against softer opponents to start with because the sharpest players in the lobby on both DraftKings and FanDuel can't play contests under $3 entry fee. And you're going to put 75% of your daily wager into 20 maxes and 150 maxes and 25% into single entry and three maxes. This is going to give you a good mix, a good portfolio of contests where you're playing some multi-entry contests where you can get a lot of unique lineups into play, along with some single entry and three max contests that can be a little higher variance because you're only playing one lineup, you're only playing three lineups into those contests, but those contests tend to play a little bit softer. There's softer competition in those contests. So that combination of contests and bankroll strategy together is going to give you a strong portfolio that is allowing you to maximize your profit while minimizing your risk over the course of the season. A lot of players don't like hearing about contest selection and bankroll management. I get it. It's not the sexiest part of DFS, but it is the most important part of DFS and sticking with it is the most important thing here. A lot of people will watch this video, try this for a week, try it for two weeks, and then go back into bad habits. Sticking with this throughout the course of the season is the best thing you could do for your bankroll this year. 
So let's actually get into building some lineups for NBA DFS. And the first question to answer for NBA in particular is when should you start building? In a lot of sports, you can really build as soon as you have useful projections out. For NBA, we really want to wait until we get those confirmed starting lineups. It's okay to run practice builds throughout the day and just see how things are looking, but when it comes to building your final lineups, you want to make sure you have those confirmed starting lineups for the game that is starting when the slate starts. So a bit of a smaller slate here tonight. This is a three-game slate, but we have one game locking at 530. So we're going to want to make sure that we have the Knicks and the Cavs line up here before we start building those lineups. We'll indicate that once we have those confirmed starting lineups and we run our final simulations for that game with a green check mark next to those two teams, and that's when we want to start building. Keep in mind, sometimes teams will really push this to the end. So you'll want to set a time at maybe 10, 15 minutes before the slate is going to lock where you just say, okay, even if I can't get, even if I don't have the starting lineups here for these two teams, I'm going to build and get lineups in and rebuild if I have time after the confirmed starting lineups. Yes, there will be times where the a NBA team puts out a starting lineup five minutes or less before their game is supposed to tip off. So you should be prepared for that. But in general, we want to make sure we have that final news, those final confirmations of who's starting before we build. The other thing we want to do before we get started is get our entries file uploaded into Saber7. This is going to allow us to make it very easy to load our lineups directly into the site we're playing on after they're built in just a couple clicks, saving us some precious time that we really need when it comes to NBA. So I'll go over to the contest tab and all I'm going to do is click upload entries here download my template file from DraftKings, and get my entries file uploaded for this particular slate here. We've got that uploaded, we're good to go. In this case, for the purposes of this video, I'm just playing the $1.20 max here. Again, you'd be playing a mix of different contests here following the profit plan, but for the purposes of this, we'll just do the and one. The last thing you want to do here is if you are on the Saber Sim Ultimate plan, this is a good time to get your contest sim settings loaded since we have this screen in front of us. If you're not on Ultimate, don't worry, uh, but if you are, we can go ahead and add our contest sim settings by right clicking Add Contest Sim, which is going to load in all the correct settings here for us automatically, and Save Settings. So now that we're ready to actually build some lineups here, let's assume that it's about 15 minutes before lock and we have the confirmed starting lineups for both teams and we're ready to build. The primary way that I actually go about building my lineups on Saber Sim is called Build, Review, Revise, where I'm gonna start by building lineups on default settings. I'm not gonna touch anything. Then I'm gonna review and see how I like those lineups and see how they came out and revise to make any final changes to fine tune until I'm satisfied with the results. If you're used to using a traditional optimizer, this is going to seem a little bit new or a little bit unintuitive here. On traditional optimizers, you have to program a bunch of rules and probably some exposures and other settings to get good GPP lineups in your builds. On SaberSim, you don't have to do that. When we build lineups on SaberSim, instead of just building the top cache optimals, what we're doing is we're actually going into our simulations, our play-by-play -play game simulations for each game on the slate. We simulate all these games out play-by-play -play thousands of times. We're building the best possible GPP lineup for each lineup that you're building in your pool here. So these lineups already have a strong foundation. These are lineups that would win if the slate plays out in a certain way. So we can spend our time looking at a couple particular players or spots to make some adjustments, but we don't have to upfront set a bunch of rules just to get ourselves in a decent spot, which again is super valuable for NBA. As the starting lineups are coming out 15 minutes before lock and everybody else is scrambling to adjust all their rules and exposures and all of that, we don't really have to do that. We just have to rebuild our lineups and get the latest sims in there and then we can go on with the rest of our process. So all I'm going to do here is I'm going to make the two changes to two player projections to abide by the DraftKings uh, rules here. Uh, typically, you can just do that with a 0.01 adjustment for two players. I'm going to select build settings that match up with the contest that I'm playing. If you're playing a bunch of different contests, I would just pick one that is maybe in your most important contest uh, or your um, maybe the most entries, whatever the contest is that's the most important one to you here. And we'll go ahead and build. What's happening behind the scenes here, again, is we're going into our simulations for this slate, taking out 5,000 different ways that this slate could play out and building the best possible GPP lineup for that slate. The reason we're building 5,000 here is a couple reasons. One, the more lineups we build, the easier it is to identify the best lineups from that pool. If we only built 20 for this 20 max, we don't really know if those are the best possible 20 ones we can build. Instead, we're going to build 5,000 and rank and sort them after the build. Second, building the pool of 5,000 lineups allows us to dynamically make adjustments very easily to control which 20 we ultimately want to take with us into our contest, and I'll show that here in just a sec. Now we have our pool of lineups here, and there's two other steps that we really want to knock out here first before we actually go through the process of reviewing and revising our pool. 
The first is we want to make sure our lineups are ranked correctly. So we have a pool of 5,000 lineups and by default we're ranking the top 20 out of here by something called Sabre Score. Sabre Score is an improvement on ranking lineups by projected score, which is what most other optimizers do, because it's taking into account the projection of the lineup, but also the raw scoring upside of the lineup and the ownership of a lineup all into one number that's boiled down and adjusted based on the size of the slate and the size of the contest you're playing. So these aren't necessarily just the best cash lineups out of our pool of 5,000. These are the best GPP lineups for a small slate for a contest that is 10 to 50K in size. And this is great. This is a good foundation here. Uh, this is going to give you a good idea of what the best lineups are in the pool. However, if you are on the ultimate plan, this is when you'll want to run your contest sim. If we open the settings menu back up here, we can go back down to contest sim settings and we can see that the contest sim that we saved before is now available here. All we need to do is check it and we can click run contest sim. What's happening when we run the contest sim is we're taking each of our lineup in our each of our lineups out of our pool of 5000 and we're basically asking the question what if we played each of these lineups into this exact contest tonight and we saw what happens 100,000 times if this slate were to play out 100,000 times what lineups would perform the best and this is really a precise and accurate way of determining what the best possible lineups are to play. Instead of having to uh, intuit a bit like how much ownership we should have, how much correlation we should have, uh, what the best upside plays are, this just goes straight to the source and says, what is the best lineups? How do the lineups perform over a long period of time? So again, if you're on the standard or pro plan, the Sabre score is going to do a great job of identifying the best lineups possible. But if you're on the ultimate plan, you want to make use of the contest sims to identify those lineups. Now that our contest sim is complete here, we're just going to change that sorting method. So we have a new sorting method available here. You'll see contest sim metrics show up on each of these lineups as well here. What I would recommend using is risk adjusted ROI. Risk adjusted ROI is going to take into account both the upside, how well does that lineup perform when it is cashing or when it is having a top 1% outcome, and also the downside, how often is that lineup not cashing at all, uh, how long, another way of thinking that is how long, long will we have to play that lineup, or how big does the sample size need to be for that lineup for it to become profitable, how bad are the lows on that lineup. So it takes into account both the upside and the downside, and just identifies the best lineups from your pool to play here. So now we're identifying the best 20 lineups out of our pool of 5,000. The next step we want to do is we want to diversify our portfolio. Diversification is an important concept in DFS because we don't want to necessarily be all in on all of the top plays. That can be great when it all pays off, but most of the time it's not. And you're going to have a very concentrated portfolio of lineups where you're really just putting all your eggs into one basket. It takes a long time to realize your ROI playing that way. You'll go many, many, many slates losing, 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 and then recoup all of your profit all on one big slate where your core goes off. But most of the time, there are a lot of different profitable lineups you can play, and there's a lot of diversity to the types of profitable lineups you can play. So what we want to do is we want to diversify our pool with min uniques. What min uniques is going to do here is it's going to make sure that our lineups in our set have X number of players different from one another when comparing any two of them. So by default, it's set at one, which means all of these lineups have to be unique lineups. They can't be duped to each other, which is good. But we can typically increase this a fair bit here, making sure that our lineups are different from one another here so that we're not as concentrated on a handful of plays or combinations of individual players. The rule of thumb I use for my min uniques is to figure out what is the maximum number I can set this to where I'm still getting the number of lineups I need for my contest here. So if we find that, a lot of times it's very high. Let's try seven. If we set this to seven, you'll see we're only getting four lineups back. That won't do, I need 20 here. So let's figure out where that max is. So at six, we're getting 10 lineups back. At five, we're getting 20 lineups back. The rule of thumb I like is one less than the maximum number of min uniques here. And the main reason why is I find that that comes with a nice balance of diversifying your pool. Four players different from each other in every lineup in a lineup made up of eight players is pretty diversified. But if we scroll down and start to look at how low we get into our pool, we're only at lineup 646 out of 5,000 here, and we're still playing a lineup with a 70% expected ROI in the simps. We've diversified our pool and we've made sure that we're playing lineups that are different from one another, but we're also still playing profitable lineups and we're still in the almost the top 10% of the lineups in our pool. 
you can adjust this to whatever you feel comfortable with. I think this is a nice balance. If you would prefer to be more concentrated and play lineups with higher ROIs, you can go down a little bit further. And if you want to play lineups that are maybe extremely diversified, you can stick to the actionable maximum value. But if you're not sure to where to start, I like the one less than the maximum rule of thumb for main uniques. Okay, so now we've built our lineups, we've made sure they're sorted correctly using either Saber Score or the Contest Sim, and we've established some diversification using Min Uniques. We now have a pool of 20 great lineups here that we can enter into the contest, or we're ready to review and revise further to make sure we're happy with the results here. Keep in mind, in NBA, you're going to be doing this a little bit under the gun, right? If we've taken, if it's 515 and we've taken three to five minutes or so to get to this step of the process, we have about 10 more minutes here to make any adjustments to make sure that we're happy with our lineups. So an efficient process that I recommend using for your MBA lineups here is to use the player table and to mostly study lineup or study players where you have very high or very low leverage. So you can see the leverage in this column here. And if we sort by the highest leverage plays, what leverage is, is it's taking your exposure to a player minus the ownership projection for that player. It is showing you how much over or under the field you are are on a particular player or on a particular team or something like that. You're not going to have time in NBA or you really shouldn't be spending the time to look into every single player on the slate. You should look into the ones where you're taking the biggest stands compared to the field and apply your research or gut feeling or anything else that is a part of your process to those specific players. What I would recommend doing is looking at maybe the top handful of highest leverage plays and the uh, lowest leverage plays, right? The players that you are fading the most and apply your research or your individual stands on the field from there. You can, you can lower your exposure to a player bringing you closer to the field, making your stand less extreme by adjusting the min or the max exposures. So let's say I'm looking at this here uh, and I am feeling like I want to be a little bit lower on Wendell Carter Jr. I don't want to be this high over the field on Wendell Carter Jr. I can bring my exposure down to get a little bit closer to the ownership projection, which is 25. Maybe I just want to be twice the field on Wendell Carter Jr. So I can set that at max exposure to 50. SaberSim will then make an adjustment here and make a change to uh, Wendell Carter Jr.'s exposure to match it to 50, and now I've gotten a little bit closer to the field. You don't necessarily have to make these changes. This My goal here is to give you a process to apply your research in a time efficient way on the players that matter. So reviewing the top handful of highest leverage plays on the slate to make sure you agree with being that over the field on those players, and also looking at the lowest leverage plays on the slate here. Maybe on a three game slate, you don't want to take a huge negative stand on Donovan Mitchell, right? That's a guy that has a ton of upside and can be a guy that really can punish you for being that under the field on this particular slate. Maybe we we want to make sure we're even with the field. So we'll make an adjustment here for the min exposure to get our Donovan Mitchell exposure even with the field here. So now we're getting 35% Donovan Mitchell. We're basically totally even with the field. What's happening behind the scenes here, SaberSim is going into our pool of 5,000, finding the best 20 lineups sorted by the risk adjusted ROI from the contest sims with four min uniques between each player while also applying the custom exposures we've set here so that the lineups look like what we actually want them to be for this slate. I do want to take a moment at this particular step and just quickly say that making those types of adjustments is not something that you should feel like you absolutely have to do. In fact, over the course of the season, I will probably make just a handful of player exposure adjustments, and on any given slate, I'm not going to make a lot of adjustments at all. If you are a player that knows the NBA really well and does a lot of research, this is the right way to think about making these adjustments, but by no means is it a requirement. A lot of my edge in NBA comes from taking advantage of our powerful play-by-play -play sims to build your portfolio of lineups, sort them by these powerful metrics and diversify here, and then late swap to react to the news, which I'll talk about here in a second. So if you are a little bit more of a brain player and you like to take individual stands on players, that's the right way to do it, but you shouldn't feel the need to have to do it here on any given slate, or if you're short on time and the starting lineups came out late, you are not sacrificing a ton of edge here by getting this far here and being ready to enter your lineups into your contests. Okay, so let's walk through that process here now. So we've built the lineups, we have taken a couple stands on individual players, we're happy with our results here. The next step is to get these entered here. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna click save to my contests and we'll see that this pulls up the and one that we're playing here. And all I'm gonna do is click save to my contests and then download selected entries. 
on my saber sim that is going to download the entries file and it's going to take me to the right page on the site to get it uploaded here if it's not uploading if it's not opening the DraftKings site here all you need to do is up in the upper in the settings menu in the upper right here turn open dfs site on download on and that'll open that site as you're uploading you're downloading your entries file so now we'll go ahead and upload csv and get our entries file uploaded and we are ready for lock now after the first games lock the work has really just begun here because again we're going to get different starting lineups than expected for different teams throughout the slate and we want to react to that news as the slate is going on this is the biggest source of our edge. I've said for a long time in a bunch of our other videos and content that the biggest edge in NBA is late swap. A lot of the reason why I'm not overly concerned with taking stands and applying a bunch of research at lock is because I know most of the time I'm going to get impactful news that changes the slate later on, and a lot of the field isn't going to react to that news at all, and those that do aren't going to react correctly. So let's talk about what the process here looks like when you're actually going and late swapping. You'll want to come back about a half an hour before the next round of games is going to start or 15 to 20 minutes before the next game starts. So again, small slate tonight, but that would be around 7.15 to 7, uh, 7.30 to 7.45 or something like that. And we want to check for the confirmed starting lineups here now for the Spurs and Phoenix, right? Making sure that those teams are confirmed. Let's say, for example, on this particular slate that the Suns decide to give Kevin Durant a rest night here and that news comes out after the slate locks. The very first thing you want to do is you always want to check for the quick swap icon here in the upper left. This is going to say if there are players in your entries file that are out. If this has turned red, it means you have a player that is not going to play. They're going to get a zero if you don't remove them. So the first thing you always want to do here is click this and swap out the player here that is marked out with the best available player. This is a little bit better than doing this on DraftKings or FanDuel. I know both of those sites have a kind of quick swap type tool. The reason it's better here is because instead of just directly swapping to Kevin Durant in the same player in every lineup, we swap him into the best player available based on the position and the salary remaining in the lineup here. So in this case, we're getting Evan Mobley in two of them and Julius Randle in two. After we've applied, all we want to do here is download the entries. And this is again going to take us back to DraftKings where we can upload a new entries file and get Kevin Durant out. So at this point, at least we know we're not gonna get a zero for Kevin Durant in that case. But next, we want to actually run a late swap. We want to rebuild our lineups around all the players who have already locked into the early game with this new updated news we have. When Kevin Durant gets ruled out, a bunch of these Suns are going to jump up in their projections. They're all going to get more usage. They're gonna get more minutes. We wanna take advantage of that and probably get some more Suns in our lineup. So what we want to do is now start a late swap. And for the purposes of this video, I'm going to show you the simplest way to run your late swap, the most time efficient way to run your late swap, and what I would recommend doing. We'll release some other more advanced videos in the future talking about more contest specific late swap strategies, but this is the simplest way to get it done. You just want to click the button right to the right of the quick swap button. This is the late swap button and select the contest that you want to be late swapping here. In this case, it's just the and one, and I'm going to go ahead and click late swap. Now this is going to take us to a new late swap build here. So this is where we're going to swap the lineups here for the first time. So for the purposes of this here, let's go ahead and again, play with the idea that Kevin Durant is out. You wouldn't have to do this when you're actually building your lineups. I'm just bumping up projections here so we can get some updated projections of what this team might look like here if Kevin Durant was ruled out here with a bunch of different players here. So this would happen automatically once the confirmed starting lineup, the check mark is there. In this case, I'm just showing this as an example here. So from here, the process is going to be very similar to what you are doing before lock here. You mostly want to make sure that your settings here are set to the correct settings here. And what this is going to do is it's going to swap all of your original lineup. So I have 20 here, and it's going to give you by default 10 different new options for each of those lineups here that you can potentially swap to. And then we'll grade those lineups on the other side. And we'll go through the same process there. You can increase the number of swaps per lineup here up until the pool size that is allowed on your plan. So for standard, that's gonna be 500. For pro and ultimate, it's going to be up to 5,000. So in this case, I could increase this up to 250 swaps per lineup. Keep in mind that if we do that, it's going to take longer to swap. So you, if you're under a time crunch, you may not want to increase that all the way. And you might not get actually 250 different swaps for each of your originals here. But as a general rule of thumb, you probably want to increase this to the maximum value you can uh, 
while getting your pool size as high as your plan allows here while making sure that you're able to get this in in time. So we'll go ahead here and we're gonna swap each of our lineups. We're gonna get 250 new versions of each of the swaps here. Um, and I'm going to make sure that for the purposes of this here, it is as if the New York game has already locked. So from here, we'll just go ahead and build some lineups and we'll pick it up on the other side. Okay, so we've got our build here now. We've now swapped and we've re reacted to, to the news here. You can see right off the bat, we're already getting quite a few more suns popping into lineups, which we would expect if Kevin Durant had been ruled out. A couple quick notes. First of all, I did want to mention, you don't have to manually lock the games in that I've already locked. I'm only doing this for the purposes of this video because this slate is not live. Um, when you're actually late swapping your lineups, we will lock the games for you that have already started. So don't worry about that. And second, note that we built 3,096 lineups here, even though we were trying to get up to 5,000, right? There's only so many swaps that can happen. The further the slate goes, the lower your pool is going to get as lineups are either completely locked or only have a couple players remaining. So that's totally fine. So the next steps here are the exact same as they were before lock. We're going to do the exact same things here. So first things first, we want to double check, make sure we're sorted the right way. By default, Saber score is going to sort correctly, but we'll want to run a contest sim here if you're on the ultimate plan. So we can go back, double check our contest sim settings, make sure everything looks good. The main thing we want to do when we're actually late swapping here is make sure use live sims if available is checked and use live field lineups if available is checked. What that's going to do is take into account how players are actually performing in the game so far, and also what did the field actually do in these contests here now that one game is locked. It's just going to make sure that your contest sim is getting increasingly more and more accurate as the slate is going on, because it's not only taking into account the updated news we have for the games that are upcoming, but it's taking into account what has happened in the games that are already live, and now what are the best and most profitable lineups to play. So we'll quickly run our contest sim here so we can grade these lineups out again, and we'll go from there. Okay, so we've got our contest sim run here. We can see the new sim ROIs popping up here down at the bottom now, and we're going to go ahead here and change to risk-adjusted ROI. Now, I don't know if it's jumped out to you as much as it did to me here, but one thing that's going to pop here all of a sudden is we're going to see that our ROIs are actually higher in this swap build than they were before lock. And I know we're kind of simulating an example here of Kevin Durant getting ruled out, but this is actually what would happen here on this particular slate. When that news breaks and Kevin Durant gets ruled out here, assuming that the field is not adjusting optimally for this news here, we're starting to get ownership discounts on these Suns that are even better values than they were before the lock. So our lineups are now in a better position to succeed because some of the field didn't swap or they didn't leave themselves the right kind of swap options available or uh, maybe they didn't swap efficiently or they ended up out of time because they were trying to undo a bunch of rules and things like that. We're getting a little bit of an edge on the field here by taking advantage of this latest news and making some swaps here. So our ROIs are a little bit higher. The next step we want to do here is we want to diversify again here. Uh, one thing to note is as the slate tends to go along, you may find that you're able to get less and less min uniques. And that's totally fine. That's just a factor of the fact that your pool is getting a little bit smaller and a little tighter as the slate is going on and you have less uh, unlocked players in each of your lineups. But we'll test this the same way we did before. Let's see if we can get back up to six min uniques here. So we can't get to six min uniques. So five is now, five is not our maximum. Let's try to go to four. So four is now our maximum number of min unique. So now my lowest, my one less than the max here is equal to three. So again, we're a little less diversified in our pool here, but that's okay. We're getting a lot of exposure to suns here. We're still diversified and we're still playing a, a good portion of the most profitable lineups in our pool here. So we've now swapped, we've taken advantage of the news, we've sorted our lineups and we've re-diversified ourselves. The next step now is to double check our exposures again. We want to review and revise here. So let's go ahead and look and now take a look at our leverage here. So our highest leverage plays, we are pretty well exposed to Mobley here, but we're getting a lot of leverage and we're getting a lot of high leverage on some of these Suns players here. So feeling pretty good about that. I'm happy with that. Kevin Durant got ruled out. I want to get some exposure here, but this is where you'd be applying your research again. And really when you're thinking about applying your research, what you really want to be thinking about is what exposure am I happy with for the players whose games are starting next, right? So if you're short on time, you really want to focus on, okay, the Spurs and the Suns, what players do I want to get here? What players am I most want to be over the field? What players do I most want to be under the field or avoid in this particular case? 
the next game locking is the most important one here. And again, you want to take into account how much time you have available before the actual game locks. If you don't have opinions or you don't have time, it's totally fine here, but you want to look at your highest and lowest leverage stands to make sure it lines up with your opinions on the slate. So now we have our swap ready for the Spurs and Suns game here. We're good to go. We're gonna go ahead and click save to my contest here to once again, save this to the correct contest here. We'll click save to my contest, download selected entries, reopens DraftKings, and now we can take advantage of that Kevin Durant value that has opened up here in this hypothetical situation where he's gotten ruled out. So now we're all set here. We can see that the source has changed to swap one and we're all good to go. So we've reacted to the news for this particular game. Now there is, of course, one more game on this slate. So we would want to do this again here, reacting to the news and the starting lineups here as the Magic and Clippers lineups come out. So I'd sign back on probably about 8.10 and check for those starting lineups here and repeat the process. I'll check to make sure that the quick swap icon has not turned red. If it has, a player's gotten ruled out that I wanna get them out of my lineup, swap the best player in here and make sure that, that that's all good. One thing to note here, process changes a little bit after you've done your first swap. You don't need to go in and initiate a brand new late swap at this point. We can reuse this swap build here for the rest of the slate. So let's say now, um, again, I'm gonna lock the um, Suns game in here. You wouldn't have to do this part. This would happen automatically. But once we lock the Suns game in, we can simulate, okay, now we're reacting to the final game on the slate. So once we have those green check marks here, we want to run our last and final late swap for this slate. To do that, all we do is click rebuild lineups. This is going to trash the lineups that we already have made here and now rebuild the best possible lineups here for the final game on the slate, reacting to the starting lineups there, reacting to the uh, how the games in progress have been going so far and rebuild with the final lineups here. In this case, you can see now we're down to just 244 lineups. Our lineups are increasingly getting more and more locked in. You can see this lineup, for example, only has one spot left to fill in for this particular slate here. Um, so we're getting a smaller and smaller pool, but that's totally fine. We would do the exact same steps for this build now. We wanna run our contest sim. So we'll simulate this new pool here and see what the most profitable lineups are that we can play for each of our originals here. So we'll give that just a second to run here. Now that our contest sim is done, we'll go ahead and sort by risk adjusted ROI. Remember if you're on standard or pro, you're just using Sabre score here, that's totally fine. And we'll try to diversify again here as best we can. We'll see what the maximum is. The max looks like it has come down to three in this case. So I'm gonna drop my min uniques down to two here, again, playing one less than the max and make any final adjustments to exposures here, uh, knowing that you know it's going to get a little bit harder and harder to make changes to these exposures now that there's only one game left on the slate. But any final thoughts you have on your exposures here, if you wanna make any changes to your leverage, uh, to your highest or lowest leverage plays here, you can make those final adjustments here. And once you're happy, we go ahead and save to my contest one more time and download selected entries. And we are all set. And that is the process that I use for every single NBA slate when it comes to building your lineups at lock, getting your lineups in at lock on time, and late swapping to react to news throughout the slate. Now, as we start to wrap up here, I do just want to touch on a couple points. Mostly, where does the edge come from in this particular process? I think that's an important thing in DFS to be able to communicate what your edge is and what makes your process profitable, because then as you're improving your process and iterating and getting better over time, you know what are the most important things to be doing here. So the places where the edge really comes through with this process, the first is the play-by-play -play game simulations that we're using here, right? You'll notice throughout this entire video, I didn't really talk that much about basketball specifically. I didn't go and do advanced stats or talk about rotations or uh, usage or anything like that. And that's because our play-by-play -play sims are automating a lot of that work. Our data science and models team has put a ton of work into our simulation. Every lineup you're building here is the best possible GPP lineup that could be built for a play-by-play -play sim of each game on the slate, the way that the slate could play out. And I trust the model quite a bit here and have found it to be very successful for me. Again, if you know basketball really well and can do high value research to identify what types of plays you want to get, there are opportunities to make those kinds of adjustments. We've walked through them in the video, but the play-by-play -play sims are enormously valuable here and a very valuable part of the process, both in making this time efficient and making sure that you're getting profitable lineups on the other side. The second part of where we're getting a huge edge in NBA DFS is from late swap. 
We are reacting to news breaking throughout the slate as we're getting different starting lineups, as the projections are changing, as players emerge as new values, all of that kind of stuff. We're also accounting for the live data if you're using the contest sims of how players are already performing in their particular games, reacting to that and running sims that are taking into account the actual ownerships and the actual scores of players as games are going on. This, combined with the play-by-play -play sims that are updating and running throughout the slate, is really where that edge comes from. We're reacting to every bit of information every step of the way throughout the slate to make sure we're constantly playing the most profitable lineups in each of our entries throughout the slate. If you are not going to be able to late swap an NBA slate, you should take that slate off because it is an enormous part of your edge and the most important part of this particular sport. Finally, I want to set some realistic expectations of what the swings of NBA DFS are like. I've mentioned before in some of my other content for other sports that, for example, you can play an MLB slate well and completely brick the slate and lose all of your entry fees. That's a little less likely to happen in NBA because most of the time we're going to be having a lot of exposure to just players that are projected very well relative to their salary. However, DFS and NBA DFS is still a marathon and not a sprint. This is why contest selection and bankroll management is crucial here and following the DFS profit plan is the number one most important thing when it comes to NBA DFS. This is a strategy that will allow you to efficiently build lineups that will be profitable over the course of the season. It doesn't mean that you're going to be profitable on any given night. In fact, you're probably going to be unprofitable on most nights. You will realize your profit on one, two, maybe three, if you're lucky, big slates throughout the entire season where you're having a top 0.1% finish or you're finishing first in a contest and recouping all of your profit. But if you are following this here and finding that you're kind of just treading water here or losing money slowly, that's normal. That happens to every profitable DFS player. The goal is to keep sticking with this here, play your bankroll and contest selection in a way that allows you to weather those swings and give yourself time to realize the profit here that this will ultimately bring to you when you have those couple of big slates throughout the season. And finally, my goal for this video was to give you a simple and efficient, profitable process that you can follow for NBA DFS this year. The most important thing you can do from here is get this process down, get used to how it feels to build your lineups at lock under the time pressure, to swap for each game, reacting to the news as news is breaking. Your goal really should be for this process to feel like it's second nature, that you can do this in your sleep easily and react to the news, staying up to date, getting it all in under the time crunch of each game locking. But from there, there are absolutely ways you can continue to level up this process. They mostly come by means of getting more contest specific with your contest sims and your late swaps to make sure you are swapping optimally for specific individual contests. That does add a little bit of complexity. I'll talk about that more in a future video coming out in the next few weeks. But for now, focus on getting this process down. It's going to give you a great foundation for your NBA season. Now, I hope this was a helpful video, but I'm sure you still have questions that I wasn't able to answer here. The best places to ask those questions are in our Discord server, emailing support at sabersim.com, or using the help chat. Both me and our other coach, Andrew, monitor this help chat all day, pretty much every single day here, and we'll always be happy to respond to any questions you have here, just clicking the question mark and sending us a quick message. If you watch this video and you're not already using SaberSim, you can sign up for a free five-day trial on our site, sabersim.com. Sign on, check it out here, and you'll see how much power and speed and control you have over your lineups here, especially in a sport where reacting to that news is just so, so, so important. I hope you enjoyed watching. In the meantime, best of luck this NBA season, and I'll see you next time.